day of our conference and our first speaker today is David Beck with the talk from virtual machines to cloud native PostgreSQL in Kubernetes. Uh, hello, uh, my name is David. Uh, thank you for the patience with uh, some technical difficulties. Also, I today work with uh, some kind of sore throat, so excuse my cracked voice. Well, uh, a few words about me. I, let's say, come up to the world as a Java developer, then I've moved to the inter infrastructure field. I do have some footprint with Oracle Cloud and AWS and currently GCE. Uh, I am a Kubesronaut for those who are not uh, let's say uh, we still haven't heard of uh, CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. They do have some certification around Kubernetes, and this is basically what I did to achieve this. Uh, for today, I would like to present you the case study of one application of, let's say, medium size, very typical one, customer facing one that we have migrated with the help of one of the Postgres operators uh, to the Kubernetes. And I will not like judge or not try to suggest or give you some pieces of advice uh, for your workload. I will try mostly to describe what we did and especially what was our thought process behind it, why we have decided in such a fashion, etc. So hopefully this might be useful for you to pick up some tracks for your own decision making uh, in the process. So we start with an application that, that has the same source code for four different domains, four different projects. We are in the position that it is already running inside the containers. It is a legacy PHP uh, for the web application part. There is some Java for the loading of the data. There are some API endpoints. It's always like a little bit complicated, right? We use Kafka for messaging. Previously, the application was heavily depending on the CSV batch loading of the data. And even after several years, we are still in the process of migrating from that. I know that this is not bleeding edge, and I think that this might be even more useful to you because not all of us are running uh, latest and greatest, right? We also accept the Postgres. We use MongoDB and Redis. These are already uh, converted to Kubernetes. Uh, so we use primary for the most of the queries. Uh, there are some number of prices and stock levels because this is an e-commerce application that we recalculate every day, uh, even through some Postgres functions because uh, the backend logic is like 1% in the database, 99% elsewhere. Uh, so it is kind of a mixed workload. And there is some turnover that the customer are able to make through this uh, four uh, websites. This is a snapshot of the load for the application. So just to give you an idea of what scale we are talking about. Uh, on the left, there is a picture of the TPS through the database. So you can see that the spikes are the batch loading of the stock, prices, etc. There is the largest one in the morning and it continues throughout the day. Uh, also, when we, uh, we use heavily caching mechanisms, so typically when we like, um, discard all the stock levels and refresh them, we typically need to recreate a lot of pages, a lot of page parts uh, again. So this is also one of the parts of the spike. On the right, there is a picture from a different day and we don't currently have a good uh, security solution there. So typically it happens that some competitor of our customer is trying to scan the whole website. This is one of the days that they were successful and unfortunately they are uh, getting more sophisticated by the day. So we can see that these large spikes in the morning uh, are not regular traffic. This is some bots uh, like um, downloading everything that is possible into the database. As you can see, we are holding quite well at 100 requests per second, but when they just unbound the limits uh, to 200, we are not uh, that well. The regular traffic is on the right for them. So uh, organizational wise, uh, I think it is difficult to understand from our perspective how we needed to approach and a lot of decisions are maybe um, tightly coupled to this. So there is no full-time Postgres DBA. There are some Oracle ones, but uh, they don't help you, right, with Postgres. Uh, sorry, there will be some probably bad jokes during the presentation and some opinions, maybe unpopular ones. Uh, we have already migrated to the Kubernetes with the application part, uh, and this is very vital for us. This is like very important takeaway, probably that we already are familiar with all of the concepts in Kubernetes. We know how to run it in production. We know how to, uh, how to monitor it. We know how to talk to a client without 
aspects of this, etc. For the application, surprisingly, there are no SLOs, even though this is like mission critical, of course, for them. And the client is, of course, trying to save as much as possible. So even a discussion like, oh, let's have a new VM for a whole month is something that we need to discuss and is not like, let's just do it because of the scale. Uh, previously, there were some not very good um, events, let's say, on the project, so we don't uh, mean to mess this up. Uh, and we have already migrated from Zabbix monitoring to the Prometheus one. This is also a very important step, because if we are able to just to plug into Prometheus, it is much easier than Cliff. The Postgres itself, uh, of course, this is the OLTP workload. The, the databases are not very large. We are talking about like 70 gigs each. Maybe uh, when we uh, discard some data, we are able to get to 50 gigs each, something like this. The uh, traffic is not split evenly. So you can see that the percentage is there. Uh, just to give you some clue, that is one project that is like top of this and several, three of them are with the less traffic. Uh, we don't use any connection puller currently, or haven't used at that time, sorry. Uh, there is a VMware underneath, and I will get to it later on, because the VMware, unfortunately, is the weakest link in the whole chain. Uh, disaster recovery plan, of course, is uh, metal tested, except we have never tried it, uh, as always. And from the backupping perspective, we have migrated uh, several years ago from like bash custom scripting based backupping to the barman. And we do have uh, some uh, S3 buckets. Uh, so we offload everything to cloud somewhere safe. Uh, we previously used PG pool too, but we were very unsatisfied, but probably we were not able to configure it correctly. So there were several problems with it. Uh, my personal starting point might be also interesting because I guess that this is not what everyone's background is like. Uh, so first of all, I do have some experience with Petroni and when I tried to do a uh, first uh, switch over in the production, I just messed it up and corrupted the database. And even though I like tried to replace several times uh, what I did wrong, I was not able to figure out correctly. So this was my first production experience with Petroni. Uh, and uh, maybe it slightly affected uh, the way I, I don't like it particularly much. But probably it's not a Petronis uh, problem, it's a problem on my side. On the Kubernetes side, we do have, uh, as I mentioned, such a, some footprint, not also in the running Kubernetes uh, on-prem, but also on the Oracle Cloud. Uh, we also needed to level up the training, of course, to understand better what we are doing so we can uh, like offer this uh, professionalist to someone else uh, and what is important maybe is on the right the second uh, box that we have already tried how to run postgres in kubernetes before we have even started the decision so several of the like non-production databases for some internal toolings where we had tried zalando operator and for some smaller projects even productional one we are running cognitive pg already so we do have Quite a good understanding how to install it, what is the second day operation might look like, etc. But certainly not at the scale of the application we are talking about now. For the storage, uh, there is some experience with the Oracle Cloud. So the cloud storage is completely a separate topic, probably not go deep into it, but it is worth mentioning that this is for several weeks, at least for your investigation, benchmarking, just to understand how it works, uh, how does it scale, what TPS can you get, etc. etc. And we have also experimented with the Rook uh, SEP on-prem storage. I will maybe get to it uh, later. So the client motivation for this particular project is very good, I would say, because we have a good relationship there. There is a good track record. Um, basically, we are advocating for some enhanced high availability. And given that we had some problem on the application side, we have switched from originally like typical on-prem setup to um, uh, to Docker Swarm, then to Kubernetes with the application. The client like trusted us that it's no big deal to transfer also the database to the Kubernetes. But as we all know, it might not be that uh, easy, right? So from our motivation and from probably a lot of the facts I have just uh, told you, uh, the state full migration to Kubernetes is the next logical step because if we already have observability stack there, if we are able to manage, if the application is already there, 
maybe it's uh, it's quite logical to do it. We are at the same time not the Postgres expert, like definitely not. We are not able to tune Postgres as many of you are able to. Uh, and we just want to things get running. We just don't to have any disruption to the services and just basically get the work done and don't like stay on the project the longer than we need. Uh, we have considered to either manage Postgres, which is not possible on-prem, of course, with the client. Uh, so the Patroni or the Kubernetes operator are the viable options. I did a, uh, like a, several months of investigating the operator and there is a session, if you like, with some more details. Uh, we have compared several ones of them. Uh, basically, uh, I would I can like conclude that please do, don't go to Stagress. In my personal opinion, uh, everything else, Zalando operator, PGO from Crunchy, Ukraine TPG is completely fine, and we were not able to crash it to the point that it would lose data. Something like this. They differ, however, in very like significantly in terms of how do they react, for example, when you kill pods or to some other disruptions. Uh, for the cloud native PG, this was like the obvious choice for us, especially when the Petroni thing is like not very welcome uh, here. Uh, so what I can say that the documentation is almost the Postgres level, of course, so kudos to it. Uh, it is enterprise ready, even in the like thinking, how do they release stuff, uh, how do they inform about it, how, how detailed the documentation is for this, that particular topic, that in the documentation there are like consideration, what you should think about when you will enable this or disable this, etc. But the question was, is it mature enough? So comparing the uh, cloud native to Petroni, because we still want it to be on the safe side, remember, uh, there are some, let's say, drawbacks to each of this. Uh, for example, for Petroni, I don't like operating at CD. I have messed this up like several times. If you, I don't know if you are able to, for example, uh, rotate um, certificates perfectly, if you don't run out of space, many different stuff. So this is one pain point. Also, we would still need to provision the nodes, which we don't like it. We don't have a good tooling for node, like the VM provisioning or something like this. So Petroni was like still, Petroni on VMs was at this point still like not very useful, except it has a proven track record. This maturity that I'm talking about that we might, might get or might not get with cloud native PG. What was uh, maybe also quite uh, interesting for us was to have some kind of observability transferred to the developers with cloud native uh, PG. So if you use cloud native PG, how you can control the database? Typically, you don't use psql, as probably you would suggest it, and you modify YAML most of the time. So there on the right, there is some, let's say, example of not very trivial one. Uh, in fact, this is some kind of migration that we take. We use initDB uh, directive there to migrate, to create a new cluster and migrate through pgdump the data from some other cluster running on the operator at this point. And we are able to include databases, include roles. Uh, there is a timescale DB extension in there, etc. So we can just see that through this YAML, this is just a short example that you can, uh, this is quite powerful and you are able to configure a lot through this YAML that you, you would typically need to mix with some pet maybe on the PostgreSQL or Ansible tooling with the PSQL, etc. So even this, let's say, startup is very interesting. And for example, we use this concept on uh, acceptance environments because we are able to just kill the whole cluster, recreate it, and we do have some bootstrapping mechanism from the wall archive and last backup from production, something like this. And then we run some scripts to anonymize it. Uh, Grafana dashboards, nothing surprising there. The like the native tools that we use is K9S. So this is the Kubernetes tool to see what is happening inside your cluster. Uh, I would say it's like Midnight Commander for the older ones here. And also we use uh, kubectl CNPG plugins. Uh, there is a status and promote probably you won't need anything else, maybe except there is a PCQL if you would like to connect to the primary or to the replica. So the plugin helps you not to use kubectl exec at all, so you don't need to SSH directly, let's say, into the pods with this. So, uh, insights for developers, what I'm talking about. Uh, sorry. 
basically, this means that we are able to offload some of the observability to developers. Uh, if you know Argo CD tool for GitOps in Kubernetes, this, the screenshot is from it. So you can see that this is how the simplest cluster of one pod, this is the green tick, look like. If you open the pod, you even have uh, SSH there. Sorry, it's not SSH technically, but it, you can use PSQL there. And you also have an access to the logs. So developers for some, let's say, brief check, for example, if they just mess up something like terribly wrong or something like this, they do have slow query or something like this. They are, um, at let's say, first sight even use this. So testing the operator itself. We are discussing this heavily and we have come to use the tool that is called Litmus. It's the uh, basically end-to-end -end testing tool for Kubernetes workloads, let's say. And what it does is that you are able, as in unit tests or integrational tests, you are able to just create a test scenario, run it repeatedly, and then maybe uh, evaluate if this was successful. So I do have such a scenario here. You can also check out my presentation about some details of it. Uh, previously, we used to destroy the virtual machine in VMware, just destroy it and see if the cluster was able to recover. Now we do have a script through this tool, uh, or maybe some even bashing there, uh, that is able to do very similar thing. And there are some metrics that we gather for it. And we like heavily try, I have um, yesterday uh, have heard that Previously, when your replica was able to recover after you killed it and lost its data, it was seen like a miracle a few years ago. Unfortunately, now we consider it to be a standard. So we just expect the operator to recover from a lot of these problems like automatically and we just don't care how it does it, just do it, right? So you can see the details. Uh, there are some myths that I probably need to address because I was quite surprised how often I hear such a very maybe silly questions. Excuse me, I don't mean this offending uh, to offend anybody. Uh, so the containers are ephemeral, meaning shortly lived, but still they are typical Unix processes. And what does it mean they can run for a very long time? So for example, there is a picture of the node in the upper right corner that it is running for two years in Kubernetes, but why not, if you are not willing to upgrade. And this is not like any extreme. I have just logged into the first cluster, I test cluster I was uh, connected to. I just grabbed every pod that has Postgres or something like this in the namespace or the name, and this is the result. So you can see that the pods there are running constantly for almost 90 days, maybe today, after several weeks, it is over 90 days. And on that particular cluster, there was a Kubernetes upgrade like three, four months ago, something like this. So uh, the pods can run for a very long time. They don't need to be restarted every day. Uh, I was like not much believing uh, my ears at that time, but just this year, I had this very different, uh, very, very large conversation with this. Uh, very good Czech uh, Postgres DBA, who is like still not believing that the containers have similar level of performance that uh, you have in a VM or something like this. So there is an, uh, there are many benchmarks. This one is particularly useful because it's uh, around Postgres, it's around, of course, local storage. So I, I recommend you to check this out because uh, the like overhead is one to, let's say, 5%, depending on what you do. So it's definitely not significant. And the performance of the container is like very comparable to what you can get in the VM or even on the bare metal. Uh, another thing that I have uh, come across is that Kubernetes, uh, in Kubernetes, it is very easy to lose your data. It is not that so. There is an object called the persistent volume that describes, let's say, the stored data, the attached disk, something like this. And there is a field called metadata finalizers. Uh, and actually, how does it work? It is an array, and if there is any value in it, the Kubernetes is not able to delete the object. So for example, with our first test, we experimented with this, and if you add any custom finalizer like blah, blah, the Kubernetes will never delete the object. So this is very important for you as if you like feel don't safe with it as uh, some kind of safeguard. But typically you don't need to tune it, but maybe just to mentioning that there is such an option, and it is, uh, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to go into the details uh, here. Uh, there is also a storage class, meaning that this defines what is stored in the Kubernetes. And typically, a retain policy, sorry, a retain policy is sent to delete, meaning that by default, if the persistent volume is not used anymore, your uh, data directory is 
disattached from the node, etc., it gets deleted. But it is very easy to switch it to retain, and in that case, it will just keep it indefinitely. So maybe just beware of this small detail, which might actually lose your data. So do containers keep data after restart? Of course not. So uh, not only that, you need to be aware of that, like the modern trend and Cognitive PG is very on forefront of it, is to not use root inside the containers. Uh, you have only a root file system, so you are not able to install there anything. You are even not able to create a file there, et cetera, et cetera. And the suggestion is not do even kubectl exec, which is like an SSH into a container or something like this. So you need to take this into account and just design your container upfront so you have all the tooling you need probably. If you are in a tight situation that you are having an incident already, you will not be able to install anything inside the container and help it anyhow. You can just kill the pod, start it somewhere else or something like this. Yes, this is true. For most of us, this might be annoying, especially because this needs to change our mindset, how we work with Postgres. Kubernetes might kill my pod anytime, right? Again, this is not true. Uh, there is a like, very well described process of the victim selection, who will be killed. And very short version of it, like very gist of it, is if you use resource limits for your pod, same as your uh, resources requests, you will be in a better position and you will not be selected for the victim uh, in most clusters. If you use different values here, you might get into some kind of troubles. I won't go into the detail again, but uh, just bear in mind, set these two values to the, to the same, something like this. How long do, or how frequently do you need to upgrade Kubernetes? Uh, well, this is different. It might be annoying uh, because um, like previously it was, it was I, frequent, I would say, that sometimes the Kubernetes upgrade was not that smooth. Currently, for like, uh, I do have the number two years, but maybe even three or maybe even more years. It's not that so. Kubernetes is, I would say, like super stable, mature, and the basic APIs don't change. So typically, if you have, if you don't have like something exotic, like GlassTFS or something like this, typically you don't need uh, to do anything to upgrade and it's a very smooth process. Also, the tooling matured a lot, like significantly. Uh, so in my opinion, this is not a problem anymore, but it certainly used to be in the past. Uh, there is still no LTS version for the Kubernetes. There are several discussions how to do it, uh, if, they sh if someone should do it, who should pay for it, as I understand. Uh, but you don't need to upgrade in the frequency of an, one year because uh, free versions are still supported and there are free versions each year. So it you should update every year, but if you don't do so, you know, also it is very highly correlated with the upgrades of your Postgres. So if you are doing a minor version upgrades, you can typically tie this together as, as you prefer. Um, there is uh, already from 2021 a paper uh, or survey that a lot of Kubernetes users at that time already run stateful workloads in Kubernetes and more of it, like the vast majority, is considering. And it, this is maybe three years ago and of course if you can imagine like a regular typical Postgres DBA with um, a comparison to some Kubernetes guy from 2021, this might not be the same group. But uh, it still maybe suggests that it is not as a niche idea and it is still progressing somehow slowly, but it is progressing, I guess. So let's get back to our application from like the general discussion and how should we approach it? First, planning. Uh, uh, you have already seen that the technology wise, we have made the selection after some research. So we did our homework there and this is just about the application itself. Let's verify the solution on the acceptance environment. And then let's try to migrate from production uh, to productions, right? From the old one. So first block storage. Uh, there were several options that we could suggest. Uh, we had a very bad uh, partner for the on-prem VMware management, to be honest. So he was not able to offer us anything here. If there would be any solution from VRware that is integrated into the stack, we would just benchmark it and took it. 
no thinking about it. We did experiment and it took like a month of my life to check uh, set FS or with the Rook extension for Postgres. Uh, if you have a lot of free time, you can definitely do it. But in the end, it's definitely not viable for such a small scale project. Uh, let's say that the set FS maintenance is very similar maybe to Postgres. So you need to onboard a lot of stuff uh, to be confident that you are able to do this in production. It's just not worth it, especially for a project of this size. Um, so we have stuck with the local path and even though this is like mm, frowned upon from the kubernetes perspective that you did because this ties your workload your pod to that particular node and it is not able to switch to different node right because the data are tied to that particular node uh, so you can either provision this statically or you can use a tool that is called local pub provisioner which can do this automatically for you but bear in mind that we know that if we lose node we lose also the pod and we need to reprovision it. This is the takeaway. And this is, of course, something that we don't particularly like, but all the experiments with Ceph or some finding some other solutions failed here. So we do use local. Uh, maybe uh, just last mention, as you, as you understand, maybe if you are running 17 gigs database, uh, the machines are like 25 gigs or something like this. We are running like 90% of the workload in memory, in fact. So we use uh, discrete and IO only for some lookups in the historic tables, etc. Like vast majority of what is hot from the data perspective is inside uh, the memory for us. And this is also a significant step. Maybe you have this very different. So networking, uh, do we need? Anything else? If we have already the application inside Kubernetes cluster, we plan to have a database inside the cluster, do we need anything else at all? So if there are some hardware load balancers, I definitely suggest to check your options here. We haven't, um, we couldn't do such, uh, such a way, again, because of the VMware license limitations uh, at that particular data center. Uh, so there are several options to use virtual IP addresses inside the Kubernetes. Uh, they all have some limitations and they are tightly depending on the networking stack that you use, but this is completely fine. We have tested it and it's like very solid. It switches perfectly uh, in case the node dies, etc. It's like proven technology very well. You can also use node ports. Uh, the node ports have uh, could have an extra network hop depending how you set them up. So this is not preferable in our case. Um, uh, basically, we have ended up not using anything at all. So, like, I mean, we use node ports for the developer access to the clusters, but given that we uh, run in the same cluster, we don't need even to have anything in between them, and we just use Kubernetes networking. For the CNI, so this is the networking layer of the Kubernetes, just use Cilium, don't think about it. Uh, PG Bouncer, should we use it, or are we good still without it? Uh, so, there are there is some kind of artificial limit that we have this uh, cast, uh, 400 connections, but effectively, given that there are fixed thread pools on Java, we use PHP again with a limited number of the worker nodes. There is like a hundred used most of the time, something like this, maybe it gets slightly up and down, but it is not that much. So we don't need it from the number of connections perspective at all. Uh, and as I mentioned, after our testing, we very well understand how the application behaves in case of failures. So when there is a failover, a switchover of any unexpected problem, we understand that the disruption to the Kubernetes networking is kind of minimal. This applies if you have short-lived connections and it's like perfect because the downtime is uh is there is like five maybe packets that fail or something like this this is a very small problem but if you have long running connections you can run to the problem as in many many services that when you do a switch over your some of the clients are still connected to the old primary even though it is replica now so they get the annoying error that uh, you are writing, that there is a read list transaction or something like this from Postgres. And of course, you need to kill the application workers and just start them over so they will get a new IP address for it beneath the Kubernetes service. This is the way how it works. And uh, for us, given that we want to have persistent connection on the PHP side, uh, this is the best option. Although we could switch to the not pconnect, uh, like uh, persistent connect, but just to the connect. To solve this, there we do have some fixes in the application itself, so it is able to uh, recover from this. 
So about Kubernetes clusters, we heavily wanted to have this as a managed service. We have discussed this like for two years with the, our VMware provider. So he will be able to buy something in the VMware world that will give us the clusters and we don't need to care about the data plane. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't happen. We needed to study it. We needed to uh, really understand what is happening. And we run clusters currently ourselves on-prem through Kube ADM. Just if you are trying to do, if you are, or maybe if you are trying to uh, think about this, if you offload this, you will have a uh, much better days going on, I guess. Uh, there is also a possibility to use control plane completely remotely. So if you have a stable internet connection, you can just provision your control plane and add worker nodes somewhere. There are several services for this. So there are options how to do it. So you don't need to take care of the control plane and like uh, increase your cognitive load by understanding how Kubernetes uh, internals work, what etcd does, uh, etc. Uh, so this is the starting point that we originally had uh, for the uh, applications. This is slightly misleading because uh, each of the application, each of the VM was of different sizes. Uh, but for simplification, I made it like this. So there is a primary that has some certain size for the workload. The replica is significantly smaller and it is not able to fail over instantly. So the idea was that we do control at CD hosts hostname entry and if there is a problem there is a person that manually increases the size of the replica and changes the ip address of the etcd host and uh, two of the databases with the smallest workload shared a node uh, and also the, the replica for for this particular so how should we approach the transfer to kubernetes what should we do we do have such a network split but we said Okay, our major problem is the VMware part. And we had, uh, throughout the single year, we had like three different outages, multi-hour outages, when the VMware storage was not working correctly and it took like two thirds of the VMs like completely down. They were not able to start for several hours and the rest was in read-only mode for the root file system or something like this. So the VMware, for, from our perspective, uh, part the infrastructure was still the weakest point and there is not much like um, idea if if your uh, like uh, hosting provider is not able to segregate the storage and the compute parts, it is not much useful to scale more to have multiple replicas, etc. Because if there is still a single point of failure somewhere underneath you, why why to bother and just pay more? So we are in a situation currently that we do have one primary, one replica. They have the same size, and we have also like. Uh, normalize the sizes of the pods. Uh, so we do have the two larger uh, domains on the same database size, two smaller ones on some something like half of it. So for example, this is some kind of illustration how the pod versus node allocation may look like. So you can see that there is one node that is extra. Um, as I mentioned with the local storage, we are able to lose one node in this setup. Uh, and that's it, basically, and still be safe. Um, Anti-affinity, affinity means that you are able to tell that please don't schedule the pods, the same pods of my same cluster on the same node, which is, of course, desired from our perspective. Uh, it is by default uh, already enabled. We have also experimented with some other ideas because, for example, we wanted to have on a single node, we wanted to have only one primary no matter which database cluster it is out of these four applications, etc. But in the end, we have simplified this like significantly uh, because there was still idea that in case of failure, two databases, the larger databases, might be on the same node and we need to be able to run in this way. So a lot of like these ideas went to nowhere dead end and we just simplified our like original requirements to something much more stable and easier, let's say, to maintain. <clears throat> so uh, automatic failover also like significantly changed our approach here because we want automatic failover after what we have seen, how it is smooth, how well it behaves, how limited the disruption is, etc. Uh, there, of course, was some pushback. If we should maybe save some money and have smaller VMs, etc., don't do it. Just if I may give you one piece of advice, don't sacrifice the uniformity, some kinds of ease of operations 
for some small bugs that are not significant in case you are having an outage. So, uh, but theoretically, I just need to mention that there is a great doc uh, part for uh, community FPG, and there are much better architectures that what we have, what you are seeing here. Uh, typically, that you share nothing, and uh, the failure um, can be, let's say, contained only for a single database, single port, or something like this. We are not in that state uh, willingly. Let's let's talk about the disaster recovery and backup uh, options. So we use Barman for this. As I mentioned, the database is quite small, so we are confident that we are able to download it from the internet, from the archive in the worst case scenario. And we have even tried to, um, because as I mentioned, there were several outages, multi-hour. So um, after them, we have tried to create completely from scratch in the cloud, the same setup for the application, also the application part, and also the database. And given we have the data in S3, we are able to do it quite easily. It takes under 40 minutes. This may seem like it's so long, you know, but uh, for the client, uh, it takes several hours to make a decision to do a failover to some, let's say, secondary location. And at the same time, he's not willing to pay for the secondary location being able, uh, like, non-stop to take some load, something like this. So this is, uh, even though these numbers might be scary, and especially because of the size of the project, uh, if the client is okay with it, I have completely no problem with it. It is, I don't know if cost efficient given <laughs> his revenues, but who knows if this is just uh, maybe mentioning that this is okay for them. Uh, so this is definitely not the bleeding edge and the part where you are able to do. Uh, if you would like to have something like much more tighter, you are definitely able to get much better results in here. Uh, there is an option to use uh, snapshotting of the volumes. Of course, if you are in the same um, data center or something like this, and if we would have a large database, I would definitely consider it if our VRM provider would allow this. Uh, this saves time like significantly. It is really game changer because if it comes to the disaster recovery, because even the terabytes of data you are able to cover pretty pretty easily. So let's discuss some tuning possibilities. So first of all, we wanted to uh, offload the uh, temporary tables to uh, uh, on the table on the Postgres uh, table space level. So uh, from recent versions, Cognitive PG is able to do it. You can you can just select the size of the disk if you like. Uh, so this might be useful if you are having network attached storage as a primary, you can still use the local disk for temporary files, which you don't need to be stored like per persistently. Uh, there is an option to allocate CPUs of the pod directly to the hardware run. But of course, you need to do the same thing on the VMware to make this like any benefit. But just mentioning that we have experimented also with this. Uh, after many discussions, how we should approach over provisioning, just don't over provisioning, I would say. Uh, don't do anything around it. Don't think about it, especially for your larger uh, databases. It's just not worth it. Again, if you are willing to save some bugs on the devs, this might be very different, but for the production, just don't do it. Uh, storage, you will typically get the same as VM, so there is not significant difference there. From the uh, Postgres perspective, I. I would say this is very similar to probably you already know from Patroni. So most of the knobs you are able to tune somehow. There are some extensions like included, uh, which are typical. Only one that uh, was missing for me was PG Repack. So we needed to create a custom Docker images for it. But maybe I'm like the not, not the majority using it. I don't know. Uh, Alter system is not. Uh, let's say, uh, suggested. And as I understand from the recent versions, it might be even disabled, which is which is very nice. Uh, so this is mostly what you will get. Uh, there is There are some details around the shared memory that you need to provision to the pods, but this is, let's say, a minor detail that you will send once and then use again. There are options to use other uh, extensions. For example, here, there is some image uh, with the timescale and also post-gist, if you like them. Uh, it is very easy to use them. You just swap the image and you have the extension included with this. You are not able, of course, as I mentioned previously, to SSH into the container and install there something. So you either find the image and trust the, the supplier of the image, or you need to create the images yourself. And of course, if you do this, you need to keep up with the latest uh, versions for the security reasons. So it is always a train of somewhere. 
Maybe a small detail on the port uh, memory. It might be obvious, of course, but as I understand, uh, like most of us are doing something around 25% uh, for the shared buffers or frame, typically, I, I would assume. So on the VM, this is the upper part. How does it look like that the memory taken by the Postgres process is around one third or something like this? And there is a lot of uh, OS level caching, of course, that is used heavily by Postgres and relied upon. There were several excellent talks previously uh, for this. So you don't want to sacrifice this, but just beware that from the container perspective, even though it is completely the same and under the hood it's happening in the same manner, you will see something like this in a lot of Grafana dashboards. So you will see only the uh, green bars, the real memory allocated and not the buffers. So, so just don't be mistaken. It is happening. It works. Put the box. You don't need to tune anything, but typical Grafana dashboards doesn't show the caches there. Uh, I have uh, I have selected some screenshot that is quite enlightened because there is without cache uh, in the name of the slide. So this is a good description that might be misleading if it is would be omitted. So let's benchmark the our setup, right? And really, <laughs> again, kudos to the Cognitive PG team. This can't be any easier because the uh, benchmarking uh, commands are already included in the uh, kubectl plugin. So just run them. It will automatically uh, find which uh, is your primary and just output the numbers. This is very nice. Uh, for the migration to production, we have selected a logical replication method. Uh, we have considered some other. I will have a, uh, several slides after it. But this is for our database size, the best possible solution. And also what we very much like, this is like vanilla Postgres, you are able to cross different major versions of Postgres. Why not if you are having a sufficiently small database, this is, I guess, the much more preferred solution. Also, there is a good uh, recipe how to do it. And you would be very maybe surprised how simple it is. Uh, from the recipe, they even try to migrate from AWS, so you don't even need to migrate your from your own cluster. You may even transfer the database from some completely other service, which is of course nice. So, I'll, one of the alternatives that we have tried to discuss was to have an in-place upgrade, which would basically mean that on the VM level we would shut down the database, run uh, upgrade of the cluster itself in place then start up the database, create a backup, and then copy it or something like this. Uh, uh, we have discussed this several times and benchmarked. It takes about two hours of downtime for our small database. So um, we could do it, but let's say the logical application is much beneficial and even much simpler in the end. So, But for the larger databases, I can imagine that this might be a preferred method for somehow you can all even play with the how the day, for example, combine this with the snapshotting, but just mentioning that the logical application was complete enough for us. And well, this might be very unpopular uh, because uh, just again to explain our approach, we do have an operator that is running completely on autopilot. We have tested it, battle tested it uh, with synthetic benchmarks and also in uh, less uh, less critical production but still we don't trust it, right? So there was an idea that we should have something like a pod that you can run out of the hand and mount the same data value, uh, the data volume, sorry, as the Postgres has. And you have a root, you have some Ubuntu or something like this, whatever you prefer, and you are able to install any package there and you are able to inspect the data directory of Postgres. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of it, but like typical uh, read write runs of the persistent volume mean that you are able to create multiple pods on the same node that have the same volume connected. So this is just reusing this pattern. Of course, if the Postgres is running, you are in a very dangerous spot. So there is a fencing uh, mechanism. So you are able to tell Cloud Native PG, please disable Postgres process, just run the manager and keep the pod running or there is an option uh, even to uh, hibernate, which means that it will kill all the cluster resources, but leave the data intact. But uh, for our like 
uh, we want to use this in a case of emergency or something like this. So uh, hibernation is too much. Fencing does not allow us to do inside the pod what we want. For example, if we want to use, uh, I don't know, AM check for the uh, checking the B3 indexes uh, consistency or something like this, this is the way that we have prepared. But of course, we, you need to be very careful with the uh, with what tools versions use. So basically, you need to trust the operator mostly. Don't typically, we have never needed uh, to use the previous uh, slides at all, to be honest. So from a uh, simple takeaway from this, just test the operator and up to some level you need to trust it, right? There is no other solution, you just need to commit and dive out until some, some point. Reprovisioning takes 20 minutes, so if there is some major problem there, we are able to create a new port in like maybe 15 minutes or 20 minutes, it's maybe the worst. And I have created this uh, nice image uh, through, of course, ChatGPT uh, to be prepared to and have uh, some uh, horror stories to share. But, uh, you know, until today, there was nothing. So I was uh, like very pleasantly surprised, but still I like the image, so I keep the slide uh, open. Uh, but uh, we have never encountered anything that we were not prepared for. Maybe there are several problems that we were tried to be prepared for. They are like very common, like resizing this, board has restarted, etc. A lot of these were catched through the reliability testing. So we know, for example, how does the cluster behave if you restart the port? What is the downtime? How do the applications behave? Uh, when do they switch correctly, etc., etc. So basically, or for example, if there is a problem on the performance level, you go to the um, typical Postgres tools like PG stat statements, no big deal, right? So we were prepared for, for the war, let's say, but it didn't happen, right? If you compare what has happened, how did it look like before and after? So there are several different VM sizes. Now we have more uniform setup. Uh, also, previously, the disaster recovery was kind of like, um, let's say, a manual thing, some wiki page. Uh, now it is much more like relevant. We we do it often. We try to switch over, for example, on some uh, like uh, constant basis to test it. Uh, also, the developers do much have a better understanding of what is happening inside their Postgres. They are able to do some operations themselves, for example, reprovisioning the, uh, the staging clusters themselves. Why not through Argo City? So if I, if I can make some kind of resume for our, what it meant to us, like a lot of things are much easier now. Uh, we can reuse especially a lot of Kubernetes tools that we like and we already have known before the, the operation. The GitOps principle to have the state stored in Git, operate through YAMLs, we like it. Uh, but still, I need to address that Typically, it takes around the same time to construct some more advanced, let's say, YAML definitions uh, than to use PSQL and just do it one of uh, time or something like this. Uh, it took us a lot of time to research and to verify and to be sure. Maybe we were like too scared and I, I don't know, maybe too conservative here. So maybe you can be faster with, with this know-how. And one of the largest problems that I currently see is the training. So the Kubernetes itself, of course, but cloud-native PG especially, is still very niche uh, technology, especially in the Czech Republic. So if you would have, uh, if you would like to hire someone who has professional cloud-native PG experience, good luck with that. Probably you won't uh, find anyone. So just um, some next steps that we are possible, uh, that it is possible to do just because of this effort. Uh, so even we are considering to uh, define some service level objectives to the client because we trust the solution to so much and we can prove how stable it is, what are the parameters of downtime, etc. And we are like constantly uh, increasing our observability stack. So meaning we are trying to get more data even from the some of the YAML definitions. So this is, for example, the cluster status field, etc. Uh, this is one of the screenshots that I have seen on the uh, Cloud Native PG Slack. Uh, so the guys uh, has just uh, created a cluster with image of Postgres 16, just switched the image to 17, and is concerned that it is not starting, right? Uh, so please bear in mind that these operators are uh, very dangerous in a sense that they operate a lot for you, you don't need to have a lot of basic know-how, but still it's Postgres underneath. So everything more advanced, every problem you run into that is 
Postgres related, you still need someone with the DBA background to deal with it. And it's not that easy that you will just have a developer running some kind of CRD and it will be uh, happy, uh, happy living ever after, something like this. So just bear in this mind that a lot of people see this as a simplification that you have. There was it mentioned several times, virtual DBA, someone on your side, well, it's not that particular case. Beware of this. So, uh, just to mention that we are hiring in RIC. So, if this was some kind of interesting, just come talk to us and we can discuss much more around it. And thank you for your attention. Thank you. Unfortunately, we are out of time. If you have questions, please find David outside of the room. And we are waiting for our next speaker. Thank you.